Good afternoon. My name is Georgina Hoagland, and today I will be talking about elliptic curve cryptography. So, back in the day, if you and your friend wanted to send a secret message, you would choose a scheme, say, add one to each letter of a message, um, and decrypting was as simple as subtracting that one off again. But if someone overhears you tell your friend, that whole system is ruined. The attempts to solve this problem have led us to create something called public key cryptography. So, um, in 1977, two set separate sets of algorithms were introduced, RSA and Diffie-Hellman. And that allowed us to have two different keys, a public key and a private key. So, imagine you want to send a message to your bank. Well, your bank needs to generate a public key and a private key and send you the public key. You then take that public key, combine it with your message to get an encrypted message. You then want to send that message back to your bank, who uses the private key to get back the ori original message. Now, if you have your eavesdropper Eve in the middle, she sees your public key and the encrypted message, but she has no way of figuring out, or it's very hard for her to figure out, what your private key is and what the message is. So, elliptic curve cryptography, or ECC, is a form of public key cryptography introduced in 1985. It is based on the somewhat esoteric topic of elliptic curves combined with modular arithmetic. Some implementations use the same principles as the earlier public key crypto systems, such as Diffie-Hellman, but in an elliptical curve world. Um, and this creates a seemingly secure system, and we will circle back to that seemingly. Um, so, what are elliptic curves? These are some elliptic curves. Um, notice that they are symmetrical around the x-axis. Um, and at the bottom there, we have the equation we use to generate these curves. So, this first part, we're looking at sets of points in real numbers. This is essentially means we're looking at a graph, like in these pictures. The next part in is our main equation. It may look like when you see y equals x to the third, but notice it has y squared. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, we also have to provide two constants, a and b. And we just have some basic limitations on what those can be. Um, and we also add in the point at infinity, which we also sometimes call zero. But this is different than the point at zero, zero. Um, and with this, we can define an operation on our curves that we will call point addition. So, you want to add two points, P and Q, on our elliptic curve. We draw a line through them to find the point R, where the line intersects the curve again, if such a point exists. We drop vertically across the x-axis to find minus R. We know this exists because our graph is symmetrical. So in this diagram, P plus Q equals minus R, which I know seems really non-intuitive and weird, but stick with me. So there are some edge cases, but these diagrams should give you a basic idea of how to find the sum of two points. Defining point addition in this way makes our set a type of mathematical structure like a group, not quite like a group of you and your friends, but more mathy. Um, being a group means that the sum of any two points on the curve will always exist on the curve. And we can actually get a lot more properties into our elliptic curve group if we li limit our points to be an FP, or the set of um, numbers mod a prime number P, um, rather than just for any value on our number line. Um, our group is mostly the same, but with congruences in mod P instead of equals. The set also now has a finite number of points, since mod P has you know, 0 to one, one, uh, P minus 1. So, our curve looks a little different now, but it's uh, just the set of discrete points, but you can notice that it's also still symmetrical. And addition still works, but it looks a little different as since we cycle through in mod p. It, once you get past p, it circles around and comes back in. So why do we do this? fp gives us a number of useful properties. In mod p, each non-zero point can generate what's called a cyclic group. That means if you add an element p to itself enough, you will go back to zero, and then eventually back to p, hence the cycle. Um, this can be used to reduce large multiples of p. So in our example here, if we have n equals 12 and we want to find 17p, 
We can take 12 out, get 5, and then we can also find more large multiples by repeatedly doubling p and adding appropriately. And this might look really familiar to uh, converting numbers to binary. Um, so to see if an implementation of this based on the Diffie-Hellman key exchange in our elliptic framework, imagine we have Alice and Bob who want to send messages back and forth, and they just want a shared key so they can send the message both ways securely. One way we can implement this is by exchanging public keys to generate a shared secret. So Alice and Bob choose a public point on a curve that they both know. Then they separately each choose a private key k and generate the public key, which is q equals k times p. They then exchange these public keys. And then to generate their shared secret, they multiply the other's public key by their own private key. Um, and if you look, this actually, they have the same thing now. It's the product of the two private keys times our point P, our public point. The eavesdropper sees QA and QB, the pu two public keys, but it turns out that those really don't help you find our two private keys. So we showed before that calculating Q equals K times some P is fairly quick. Um, but as we just said, though, finding K with only points P and Q is much harder. Um, this is known as the discrete log problem and is the basis of most public key cryptography. The main advantage that ECC has over the earlier systems is key size. So another way to think about these systems is not in time, but in energy. Breaking a 228-bit RSA key requires less energy than it takes to boil a teaspoon of water. Comparatively, breaking the same uh, bit length curve requires enough energy to boil all the water on Earth. So as computers have gotten faster, other crypto systems have needed to increase their key size significantly. Mathemati the mathematics of cracking the elliptic curve discrete log problem seems to be harder, quote unquote, than those of older generation crypto systems. As we increasingly need to send secure information over the internet, we need faster algorithms. Similarly, we now send and receive messages from devices like smartphones, which have less processing power and storage space, so we have a necessity for these smaller keys. In the past decade, the NSA and other cryptographers have urged organizations to switch from first-generation crypto systems to ECC. But not everyone has adopted this for a number of reasons. While it seems that cracking ECC is in exponential times, we do not have a rigorous mathematical proof of that. So some people are a little bit wary. Um, some of the technology is also owned by BlackBerry. And in the world of cryptography, propriety proprietary tech is sometimes viewed as suspicious. Um, in 2013, some of the documents leaked by Edward Snowden implied that the NSA had put in a backdoor to a pseudo-random number generator, which was people were using to generate their private keys. This would allow somebody with a secret to know the output of this random generator. Um, so the world of cryptography is also thinking about the possibility of quantum computing attacks. Uh, quantum computers don't exist yet, as far as we know. But some curves may offer only weak security in the face of a quantum attack, and cryptographers like to be prepared. Um, there have been attempts to crack ECC, and some have been successful in sort of a month to week long um, time frame for systems with keys under 120 bits. But top secret information is encrypted using keys over 300 bits, and since security goes up exponentially with key bit length, there's no need for alarm yet. So for now, we are continuing to use ECC, and it is being very widely adopted by governments, messaging technology, digital currency, and signatures. And chances are that you and your devices are using it too. Um, these are some sources for further information about the curves themselves and about the issue with the NSA. Um, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>